Hello, Sandy. Good morning, Natalie. So let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. This is uh, part four of our series on menopause and the brain uh, with uh, Dr. Sandy Rice. Um, if you recall on our first talk, uh, we described how estrogen works in the brain and how it does many important things um, to keep our brains healthy. In part two, we discussed how the loss of estrogen at the time of perimenopause and menopause affects our brain function and leads to symptoms that we know well. In part three, we went even further and we reviewed the latest literature on cognition at menopause transition, why investing in women's brain health and Alzheimer's research is so important. So now today in part four, we're going to cover what women can do to help minimize not only their symptoms during perimenopause and menopause transition, but also what they can do to help prevent overstressing their brains during this time to perhaps improve the future brain health. As Dr. Rice has stressed throughout in the previous episodes, we don't know if estrogen is the absolute answer, but we know that there are other things we can do that may help. Um, by the end of this presentation, it is my hope that you will have learned one, why your lifestyle should be your main focus right now, and two, what to tweak in order for you to power your brain and body through perimenopause transition or and menopause transition. Right, you're right on, Natalie. I, 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 I want to just emphasize how important it is during perimenopause and menopause that women keep their brains healthy. Estrogen, as we've talked about, is neuroprotective. And so when we lose estrogen, you know, we're much more vulnerable to all sorts of things, including possibly premature brain aging. So, you know, we think about the brain, you know, more cerebral type functions like intelligence and memory and creativity. But I think we don't want to lose sight of the fact that the brain controls every aspect of our body. And so we need to keep it healthy. And I I guess we should look at it as the brain is the powerhouse of our entire body. Indeed, Sandy, uh, it is my hope as well um, that we see it that way. I mean, I like this, uh, this um, uh, slide, but let me say it again. Uh, I guess if I also keep repeating it, you know, we're going to emphasize it. I'm going also to apply it more. Uh, our brain is the command center for our entire nervous system and all our internal organs. So the brain is, is a very complicated organ as you described you know, in the previous uh, episodes um, and uh, we can't take it for grant granted and, and we need to keep it functioning right. It's, uh, it's going to be um, this, the brain can be nurtured back to health at menopause transition, but it will take some work though. You know? um, functioning right, what does it mean? It's like learning, um, memory, interpretation, personality, uh, voluntary movement, uh, but also balance, coordination, sleep, uh, speech, emotions, respiration. <laughs> Blood pressure, I mean, you name it, it's just, it's just crazy uh, what the brain controls. So that's why when we go through menopause and our hormonal levels plunge, uh, our entire body, our life expectancy and our quality of life uh, are all affected. And, and most people think that there is nothing that can be done. I mean, I talk to women, they say, well, you know, it's going to go away, you know, I just have to suffer for a few years and that should, uh, well, we should live with it and get over it. You know, that's something very uh, typical of um, 
the generations, you know, we're going, we, we're living through. So, um, and, and as we know now, this is not true. We, we don't have to just wait and see. Uh, we can be in charge. Uh, in fact, it's the perfect time um, to reassess and recenter. And, and I believe, and I hope you agree too, that it starts with awareness. Away. So, what, Natalie? What? Tell us more. What do you mean when you tell your clients about awareness? Well, it, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, in, in order, so to me, when I when I say awareness, I mean uh, perception. I mean consciousness. Um, here, here is an example from uh, Dr. Sandra Bond Chapman. Uh, she is the director of the, the Center for Brain Health at the University of, of Texas at Dallas. She recently said something like, awareness of the steps to improve cognitive brain function is at least a generation behind that of heart health. So maybe by giving the, the, that comparison, you know, with uh, what we know about the heart and how we perceive, we used to perceive the heart and how we perceive it now, I'll be able to explain by I, what, what I mean by awareness of brain health. Um, she explains that when our fathers and, and grandfathers died of a heart attack uh, or stroke, you know, we attributed you know, socially we attributed it to tragic luck. Um, and, and it's true between, uh, you know, the beginning of the century to the, the almost the 50s, you know, before 1948, you know, clogged arteries, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol were considered normal features of, uh, of, uh, of aging. Uh, this opinion has changed and particularly it was changed when Congress in the United States commissioned researchers to begin tracking the cardiovascular lives of some 5,200 residents of Framingham, Mass, Massachusetts. You know, Sandy, are you familiar with the Framingham Heart Study? Oh, oh, oh my goodness, yes. It's a it's an integral part of any medical student's training. Actually, way back when when I was even training, because that study is you know, older than, than I am, really. It's been going on for decades now, still going strong. And it, it really, like you said, did introduce the concept of risk factors, meaning, you know, things that people frequently do to themselves that increase their risk of heart disease. And now it's, you know, it's just common medical practice to advise people of these lifestyle changes, like you were saying, the, you know, look to, you know, stress management, lowering the blood pressure, eating correctly, exercising, and all of those things have been incorporated into routine medical care to prevent heart disease. And it has, it's prevented heart attacks significantly, you know, since the study started, but mostly for men at that time. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they knew. That's what they knew. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, I think I really like the analogy you're presenting is because what you're saying, basically, now, Lisa, as far as telling people what lifestyle changes to protect their hearts, to, to keep them healthy, we're, we're, we're really in the dark ages, aren't we? think so. Uh, I, I believe so, Sandy. I mean, things, if you look at social media, you know, things are news, things are slowly changing, I think, when it comes to brain, but we still have a long way to go. Um, well, here is why. Uh, I uh, recently found, you know, to prepare for this, I recently found, found uh, a 2018, it's not that long ago, yeah, before COVID, but you know, a 2018 review of population-based surveys um, that described how little people know about dementia prevention and brain health in general. Where is the slide? Okay. So what the general public understands about dementia is the title I gave. Um, it seems the slide is, is a little bit complicated, but you know, I won't bore you with the details, but it's a very good summary of the work. Basically, the authors um, uh, analyzed data surveys, you know, 
public surveys uh, in different countries. So you're talking about the United States. Uh, I have Australia, England, France, Germany, Poland, Spain, Portugal, UK, Northern, I Northern Ireland, Denmark, Italy, Israel, South Korea, Singapore, and China. I mean, they really did a thorough, a thorough job. Uh, I, I, I was very impressed. And what, what they found is that nearly half of the correspondents, correspondents worldwide, mistakenly believe that Alzheimer's disease is a normal process of aging and that there is nothing you can do about it. 50% of the correspondent of the respondents to those surveys saying that, that it's normal process of aging. Remember the analogy with the heart? Mm -hmm. It's like cholesterol and you know heart attack is like, well, what we should expect as we age. So um that is the proof that the awareness is not quite there. So let's keep um pushing. Um I found uh, another study um, that is uh, also very uh, interesting to me because that study uh, is from 2017. It's a report that was also updated in 2020, as you can see at the, the top of the slide. Um, it was sponsored by the Lancet uh, Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention and Care. And what this uh, uh, research uh, showed is that um, one third, if not more, so between 33 and 40% of dementia cases can be delayed or prevented by lifestyle factors. And they've identified, and I'm sure the list is going to increase uh, as we study this further, 12 potentially modi modifiable risk factors for dementia, Alzheimer's being one of uh, uh, one type of dementia. So I wrote those factors here on the slide. So if we, the risk factors, we are, you know, let's minimize diabetes. And, and we'll talk again about diabetes uh, toward the end when we talk about the diet. Uh, minimize diabetes treat hypertension, if we prevent head injuries, if we stop smoking, if we reduce air pollution, reduce midlife obesity, maintain frequent exercise, reduce occurrence of depression, treat, or uh, uh, sorry, treat hearing impairment, avoid excessive alcohol, maintain frequent social contact, attain high level of education. These are areas that can be modified and that would reduce, that can potentially reduce, you know, up to 40% of the cases uh, leading to dementia, uh, to dementia. I mean, this is just incredible. The, in, in the next slide, you'll see that the potential for prevention is high and it might even be higher in low income and middle income populations where more dementias occur as this graph illustrates it. I mean, this is huge and, and the recommendations, as I was saying earlier, are likely to be evolving, I believe. Uh, I, I, this, this data is, is, is really incredible. And, and I do want to point out that I, you know, we're looking at cases of both men and women when it comes to their risk of dementia. And then, as we've mentioned, when women go through menopause, which is something that only women go through, of course, it can be a, a, a period where the possibility of dementia is actually jump started. And so if we can, if we can even add those specific recommendations for women in you know into the mix of of the lifestyle preventative issues that that we're describing that that could even reduce the number of cases even more uh, yes yes uh, I, I do believe so and and we will uh, uh, go further into this 
I um I wanted to share those results when I found them. I just thought it was we had to ahead of giving you a list of menopause friends and uh, uh, recipes because I noticed that to this day people uh, still have a problem believing that lifestyle modifications can help anything when it comes to diseases. Sandy. I don't know one person who does not roll their eyes when we mention lifestyle modifications. I'm sure you've had this experience in your practice. Oh, definitely. I, I think people just just believe that, that they don't really have control over a lot of their health issues and that, that it's other things like, you know, genetics or environment or, um, you know, other issues that that you know, they don't have any control over. So, you know, why, you know, why is a doctor telling me to do all this stuff? Cause it may not make any difference, but obviously genetics and environment, you know, uh, as well as lifestyles all have an impact. Can you give us a little perspective on each of those, you know, issues as far as disease prevention? Yes. Yes. Sandy. And, um, I found some very interesting numbers, you know, preparing for this, uh, presentation. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to go further. What uh, we know, you know, based on research, is that we are who we are. Based, it's it's been established based on on the three components of our genes. Yes, absolutely, our genes, our environment, absolutely our environment, and we're going to go through uh, those numbers uh, next and our choices. Um, it looks pretty equal, you know, 33% each year, but um, you'll be surprised by the numbers that are coming um, and that I found. Um, well, let's start with life uh, expectancy. And uh, I'm going to, that is going to demonstrate the, the role of the environment, and then we'll go further. You know, look at life expectancy and the environment. Look what happened in the last 100 years. I mean, our life expectancy as a species has more than doubled, I'm sorry, more than doubled since 1900 and throughout the world. I mean, it is very clear in this case that uh, the environmental improvements you know, beginning in the 1900s extended the average lifespan dramatically with significant improvement in the availability of food and clean water, um, things we take for granted now, um, better housing, living conditions, uh, reduced exposure, <laughs> exposure to infectious diseases. I think we understand better uh, after COVID. And, and access to medical care. So that's a perfect example of the influence of the environment. Before, look at the curve, and it's like before the 19th, 19th century, the life expectancy, so the average, was less than 40 years old. Of course, in, uh, in, in average, you know, there were always older people who would live longer, people who would even live uh, much shorter, like, a death even, um, but this is the average. Uh, now, people in the United States live about 80 years on average. Um, some have very short lives, and some uh, individuals survive for much longer, 100, 105, 110. Uh, now, look at this. Um, map of life expectancy from 2019. Um, I'll let you draw your own conclusions about the role of our environment globally. See, you can see that uh, we live, you know, more than 80 years old in the United States and in Europe and Australia. Look at other parts of the country, of the world. And that's 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 really impressive, isn't it, Natalie? I mean, it clearly shows that the the more developed uh, people who live in the more developed countries obviously have a longer life expectancy. And you know, this again tends to really speak against genetics as being the driver for longevity. But I still think people do feel that 
you know, genetics is a plays a big role. And again, that kind of discounts their willingness to make lifestyle changes. Can you, any other um, perspectives on the role of genetics as far as health and longevity? Yes. Uh, and, and the answer is, is quite interesting. So I try to summarize it in uh, in this slide. Um, uh, there's been there's been there's been a lot of studies uh, done, and uh, if you take um, uh, if you take the first degree uh, relatives, so the children, um, the parents, so the, the the yeah, children, the grandchildren. If you take the first degree relatives of long lived individuals, they are more likely, so according to the, the studies, they are more likely to remain healthy longer and to live to an older age than their peers, uh, suggesting a very important function for our genetic background. That is that is clear. Uh, furthermore, oh, sorry, <laughs> I went a little bit too fast and I would like to go back to this. Um, additionally, um, they, we found recently uh, the few decades, a, a, a number of genes that are associated with people who live long lifespans. Um, however, they're all listed there. However, not all people with exceptional longevity uh, have these genes. And twin studies have been, have been really instrumental um, in, uh, in estimating the relative importance of genes um, and, and environment for traits, for behavior, for disorders, and of course, longevity. And uh, those studies on, on twins um, have, have indicated that genes may not be as important as lifestyle. I mean, I was so shocked when I saw this um, these studies, and, and in particular, this large twin Danish study uh, showed that only 20 to 25% of how long the average uh, person lives is dictated by our genes, leaving 75 to 80% of our aging well in our own hands. And if I jump in, I think, you know, those twin studies are really significant, aren't they? Because the first several studies do, do you could say environment has a lot to do with, with that. But then with the twin studies, you know, they obviously grew up in the same environment. So there's obviously, yeah. there's obviously something else going on, you know, speaks to the lifestyle issue for sure. Yes. And so that leads me to uh, something else that uh, I was... I only became aware of fairly recently, actually probably this year or last year. And this is the Blue Zone study. Um, uh, so which started as a National Geographic expedition, expedition about 20 uh, years ago, led by Dan uh, Butner. So he and his team uh, traveled the entire world and they were analyzing um, uh, cultures where people lived long, healthy lives, teasing out the, the, the practice, the lifestyle habits of the world's longest living population, um, their practices in health, longevity, and medicine. And by teaming up with National Geographic and the National Institute of Aging, at NIH, they found they identified five zones with the highest percentage of uh, centenarians. And here they are. I mean, you can see them, you know, the different parts of the world. Um, they are in um, uh, Loma Linda in California, Nicoya in Costa Rica, Sardinia in Italy, Akaria in Greece, and uh, Okinawa in Japan. Um, and they found, they've identified, or they found key factors to, um, a few key factors that they all share. Um, and 
I, sum I mean, I summarized it with, uh, I'm going to read through the different um, factors, um, but just follow me on that, um, on that circle. So first thing here, yeah, they all, in those communities, they all move naturally. So they live in, in environments that constantly nudge them into moving without thinking about it. Uh, they grow gardens, they don't have mechanical conveniences for house or yard work. Um, second thing, they all have a sense of purpose. Uh, this reason for, for, for living, this is how it, it translates, you know, in English or why I wake up in the morning you know, would be the type of things. French would call it raison d'être. So in Japanese, it's called ikigai, I believe it's the right pronunciation. I had to look. And in the Costa Rican, uh, call it in Spanish, plan de vida. Um, they have a sense of purpose. So you can, you know, dig further into that. Um, they also know, third point, they also know how to slow down and recenter. So they each have their own practices. So people in the blue zones experience stress. They do, everybody does nowadays. Um, stress leads to chronic inf inflammation, as we know. So it's associated with ever every major age-related disease. The people from the blue zone in their daily routines incorporate time for each day for remembering their ancestors, uh, for praying, for taking a nap, and or you know have social events they would have happy hour with their friends <laughs> this is yeah um we have it a certain way but i think they really master it <laughs> they also they also um oh when it comes to food they apply the 80 percent rule that's what you have here meaning they don't stop themselves <laughs> <laughs> to say it um um, you know, generally, but they eat mindfully, they eat uh, with others, and um, they appreciate every bite, and um, they always keep a, de a deficit. So they don't eat until they're totally full. And that's a very important part that we'll discuss a bit further. And that's been that's been shown in animal studies when you oh, eat calories. There's just no question that that prolongs your life for sure. Yes, I mean all this all this has been demonstrated scientifically. I just we just thought that you know these these studies you know speaks for itself. Uh, people going until you know 110, 115, 120. I mean they're doing something that right. we're not mastering. <laughs> um, Everything that we're sharing has been has been shown has been uh, shown um, proven you know scientifically, and we keep learning. They tend to favor plant based food. Um, yes, we all hear about that. So they eat meat. All all of them eat meat, but you know what? Once a week, some once a month. Okay. Uh, with 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 portion size the size of of uh, of a deck of cards, so not the big you know portions that um, we tend to have. Uh, a twenty ounce porterhouse, you know. The... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not good. <laughs> that is not so good. So when it comes to alcohol, um, with the exception of the the people in California, the Adventists. <laughs> Uh, who don't drink uh, alcohol at all. You know, most uh, communities drink alcohol. They can drink wine or, or alcohol made of rice, but moderately and regularly saying, you know, they don't not drink for like a month and then go and have a party on the weekend, right? This is, uh, it's very interesting. And they also drink with friends and with food. Um, which reminds me a lot of my French roots, uh, my father saying that. 
um, what we found too is most of them belong to some faith-based community. So denomination uh, doesn't matter, doesn't seem to matter. Uh, research shows that four meetings per month will add between four, hear that, between four to 14 years of life expectancy. Um, they also prioritize uh, their loved ones and they care particularly for one another, um, investing in the youth, in the young and in the elderly with time and love direct, directly. Um, and they also have very solid social networks where they share similar values. So that's the tribe, that's the tribe thing that I will talk about toward the end. Um, yes, uh, particularly the Japanese have this um, system where they have what is called Moai. Moai, it's a group of five friends that they have and they commit to one another for life. I had never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. um, that is... That, that, I mean, that's fascinating, the, the social connection and just all those that, you, that you've presented. Um, and so what, what I'm thinking is that these are all... Um, lifestyles of people who live a long time, they have, you know, longevity. And actually, when you think about it, longevity is basically just the absence of aging, really. So they somehow have been able to prolong their life by decreasing the, the, the rate that their body ages. And that, you know, that segues right into what we've been talking about with this talk and all of our others, as far as menopause and dementia, because dementia really is a premature aging, you know, like you had said, people think it's just natural process. I mean, but it, you know, really our brains should keep going as long as the rest of our bodies, they shouldn't give out before the rest of us. So, so I really want to again, emphasize how important it is for women to be aware that the menopause transition is a time when their brains really can suddenly start aging faster, you know, than, than they have. Um, up until that point. And it's a critical time to really work on some lifestyle changes to try to prevent that. So can we go over, you know, some action points for women to, you know, to, to start incorporating into their lifestyles to try to slow down this process, especially at the time of menopause? Oh, uh, yes. Um, yes. I mean, uh, Sandy, um, it is clear that from the, the, the research and all the things that I've read, uh, it's a process. It's a process. It's a, it's a daily practice. It, it's a commitment. And it can be fun. Once we, we understand a little bit of the why and, and we keep going, it is really exciting process. So and it takes work, as I, as I said uh, earlier, and it takes time. What I, I came up with, I mean, I came up through, you know, um, the literature with eight things, eight different things that will stimulate the brain. Things that we already know um, or know about. So this is not new. I'm just, this is just a refresher, uh, of course. I just, we're just putting it in, in, this, uh, in this presentation. But um, Nelly, while, while you go through, I like people just to think about, you know, are they doing what you're recommending? You know, if we really, are honest with ourselves as you go through this. I bet a lot of people aren't doing these things. I know. Um, I mean, I also experience it, you know, <laughs> at the end, at the end of life, on my other, you know, um, specialty is like we think we know, but we actually we think we know, but we don't necessarily do or do correctly. So again. Um, let, I will. I will not have the time to detail everything I'm going to share here in this last part of the presentation, but um, just think about that and integrate them. So um, here it is. 
let's start. We talked about awareness. We explained the awareness. It is um, it is so important. Um, slow down is the second um, thing I want to say. Um, be mindful. So first awareness to mindfulness. What do I mean? You know, slow down, breathe. Uh, like meditation, uh, uh, music that will, absolutely it's been proven scientifically, that will change your brain and help your body cope with stress. You know, you can add mindfulness, you know, try puzzles, uh, strategy games, uh, sound baths. I experienced a sound bath, you know, for the solstice a couple of days ago, um, <laughs> painting, uh, coloring. I've done coloring with, uh, with some, some clients at end of life and it was so calming. So whatever works for you, uh, could be making art, I make soap, uh, whatever, slow down and breathe. Connect with your inner self, find a way. We talk about self-care nowadays. This is fashionable, but this is not just fashionable. This is a key to our health. The third one is education. Um, we're not talking about, you know, necessarily high degrees. I'm saying, you know, read the paper, read the articles, keep learning, experience with your hands, with your body, learn, uh, go to the public libraries, uh, anything, uh, keep learning is going to keep challenging uh, and uh, your neurons and, um, and create new connections as we, we explained it uh, in the, in the like, like, estrogen does in the brain, we explained in the earlier presentation. So the fourth one, and there are eight of them, uh, is I believe the right support. Um, everything is, uh, is easier when we get someone to guide us at first. And I convinced that in the um, um, blue zones, People have guides, they have community guides, they have people who they can talk to, they have shamans, you know, who are uh, 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 knowledgeable and people turn to when they experience, um, you know, finding, when they experience being lost, which, which happens. So you know, you, you can't um, find some some guides and, and it takes courage and, and time to care for your body and brain. And it takes also wanting some help and wanting to do it. So um, this is what I put under support. Uh, number five is move your body. There are lots of information out there about why exercise is, um, is just the best way to keep the, the body and the mind and the brain uh, healthy. I, I always start with my clients with breathing exercise. You know, sometimes people start working with me and they can't breathe. They, they're suffocating. They're just really not well. And, and they haven't breathed for a while. <laughs> Seriously. So, you know, there are some exercises that we can give. Um, there are lots of um, presentations on this. Next, for somebody who has not moved their body in a long time, you know, you can start the chair yoga, uh, whatever you can and uh, you, you, you like. It doesn't have to be painful. You can even go for a walk with your dog. And as a bonus, you go with a friend. Uh, keep challenging yourselves. Find things you enjoy doing. Like, I don't like running. I can't run. I don't run. But I walk fast or I, I, I move weights or I bicycle. Try, if you like tennis, Sandy, you know, um, this is whatever people like and the group, um, any, any, use any opportunity to move or also do your garden. And that way you have veggies for the diet too. It's really a way of life. Uh, but you all know about that. You know that your neurons will get um, stimulated. So I won't bore you with more. The next one is fuel your brain. So the biochemist in me, <laughs> we want to talk to you, to you about all sorts of veggies and um, 
and uh, things to do about the diet, but particularly be mindful of what you eat. It's, it's something that we think we know, um, but it's good to remind it. Um, and specifically, fuel your brain. Uh, I'm not going to be able to share and to share everything about everything here. This is a summary, um, but here are the key points. You will never go wrong eating a diet that incorporates real food, lean proteins. So you you hear it, but I give you. I'm going to give you examples: fruits, vegetables to which you add this little twist that I'm going to, um, what I call the own cultural background and taste. Ah, look, this is the one for me. So <laughs> we each come from somewhere. We each come from, from cultures where we have traditions, we have cultural uh, uh, recipes and um, specific taste. Those are very good. So lean proteins, fruits and vegetables, and a little bit of our culture, of our culture. Hercule <laughs> <laughs> Poirot would say. <laughs> so um, like we said earlier, taking care of our brain is a lifelong uh, process. We have to be patient, loving, and keep experiencing and rebalancing. The good news is when you feed yourself mindfully, you're going to feed your brain properly. Uh, and it's also going to affect the balance of your gut health. I don't have time to get into this, but if you follow those uh, um, recommendations, it will, it will affect the gut as well. And you will feel so much better. So to fuel the brain, start with thinking about what it is made of and, and, and it strives on. So our brain crave for a multitude of, of nutrients present in natural biological active foods. It is recommended to stick with food sources to improve um, your, your brain health. Water. <laughs> the brain is made of, believe it or not, 80% water. Yeah, we know that. But uh, so, you know, yes, water, but it also you choose vegetables and fruits um, and of many colors. They contain a lot of water. So I'll make it short, right? Then think about vitamins and minerals. Um, where am I here? Vitamins and minerals play an essential role in brain activity. So growth and, and, and assist the brain you know, with in energy production. You're going to hear more and more and more about energy production and the brain. You need to think about um, eating food that are rich in vitamin B, B1, B6, B12, and B9. Those are really, really important protein and good sources. Do I have it here? Yes. Good sources um, include fish like salmon, leafy green vegetables, eggs, dairy, beef, self shellfish, legume, liver, or avoid if you are pregnant, and nutritional yeast, etc. Look for uh, food rich in, in B vitamins um, when you want to prepare. Um, but when be mindful that if you do not eat um, fish, meat, or dairy, please, 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 and Sandy, I'm pretty sure you say that, please talk to your provider about vitamin 12 supplements or shots, they call it, because B12 cannot be made by the body and needs external supplies. So the deficiency in B12 uh, in particular, is definitely associated with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. So please, please, please be mindful if you are vegan or, or vegetarian. 
Uh, another vitamin that um, is really important to brain health is vitamin A. So um, it's vitamin A and E. Um, they're both neuroprotective through their antioxidant functions. Vitamin E can also increase uh, the delivery and absorption of oxygen into the brain tissue, which, which is essential <laughs> to brain metabolic activity. Um, you'll find uh, vitamin A uh, in leafy green vegetables, in orange and yellow uh, vegetables, in tomatoes, uh, fruits, uh, red bell peppers, cantaloupe, um, mango, avocado. Uh, no, sorry, this is for, uh, yeah, mango, mango, beef liver, fish oil, milk, etc. So again, you can research that vitamin E is found in plant-based oil, uh, like sunflower and safflower, flower, nuts, almonds, um, peanuts in seeds, in mangoes and avocado, olives, green vegetables like beet greens, um, spinach. <laughs> um, so just also um, just think about those vitamins because they are crucial. Uh, the brain is also very, very, a very heavy user of iron in energy production, nerve coating, and neurotransmitters production. Uh, so I like to eat the dry fruits like um, uh, dry apricots and, um, and nuts, and um, seafood is also, uh, and of, of course, the dark leafy vegetables and beans that nobody wants to eat but they're really good. <laughs> um, be mindful of not eating too much meat. Um, this We don't need you know, a ton full of all of these nutrients, but keep that in mind, you know, remember the, the, um, uh, the communities um, with just the blue zones. They eat meat, but they don't eat meat like, um, every day. Let's talk about fat. Um, our brain is made of 11% of fat, mostly protecting our neurons. So the brain craves particularly specific uh, fatty acids all the time. And this is true of the, the omega family. Um, this is not a card game. <laughs> this is the uh, omega family. So you're talking about omega-3 and omega-6. Uh, omega-6 uh, generally participate in inflammation, but omega-3 uh, turns the inflammation down, but we need both uh, to a certain you know, ratio. Um, it has been proven that omega-3 uh, consumption uh, is protective against uh, Alzheimer's disease. So keep your um, fat um, and um, moderate and, um, and be mindful of too much meat. Well, talking about meat, here are the proteins. So proteins are among the, the top brain healthy nutrients and um, but they are complex molecules um, and, and they do most of the work uh, inside our cells in the brain and they're required for the, the structure, the function, and the, the regulation of the brain structure. This is uh, the entire brain uh, network. So this is very, very important. You can find um, proteins in many different foods. Uh, the best or the most abundant um, uh, sources are found in animal proteins. Again, don't necessarily need a lot. It's more about variety. Um, but you can also find them in fish and in dairy, in soy, in, in all sorts of uh, grains um, like quinoa and buckwheat and all sorts of you know, uh, peanut butter, cashews, avocado. I mean, you find them everywhere. Just, uh, just um, be, be mindful of if you are going to be vegetarian uh, or vegan, uh, you need to make sure that um, you eat um, a very diverse um, diet. 
uh, it's not necessarily about quantity, but more about quality. So diversify as much as you can. Now, we let's talk about the carbohydrates. Yeah, you're going to be surprised by this one. So the brain's overall activity requires tremendous amount of energy. You are going to hear about energy and the brain. I'm telling you, this is coming. Despite uh, comprising only 2% of the body's weight, the brain, our brains, uh, consume 20% of our energy intake. So we need to be mindful. Um, the brain relies primarily on one sort of carbohydrates, and there might be some misunderstandings here. Please help me, Sandy, if um, it doesn't come uh, obvious. Um, there are several sorts of carbohydrates. The carbohydrate that the brain needs the most is called glucose. So it's the simplest carbohydrate there is, but it does not mean that you should load up on refined sugar products like candy, which is a different form of sugar, by the way, it's called sucrose. And it's, it's processed very differently um, by the body. The problem, uh, as we were talking about it, Sandy, is that when people say carb, when people think carb, they, they think of, you know, uh, table sugar and pasta and baked goods and, those are not made of the glucose I'm talking about. Um, the glucose is what the brain needs the most. Right, right. All, the, all those carbohydrates are they they contain you know the glucose molecule, but it's all bound up in different things, you know. And so that's I think the point is that you want to get carbohydrates, but you want to get the good kind of carbohydrates, which which are the you know which are the ones from plants and fruits rather than you know refined carbohydrates. Exactly. Um, so you'd be surprised by this. And if you want more details about uh, all this, you know, biochemistry, um, um, I really suggest that uh, two books from Lisa Mosconi um, that I respect very much. Dr. And I, Dr. Rice and I respect very much. We follow our research. So uh, it's called Brain Food and then uh, XX Brain. Um, and this this table uh, from the top the top can glucose rich natural foods uh, was uh, inspired by um, her book. Um, my favorite she, she, is the sprinkle. Yeah, her her background is 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 in nutrition, but also uh, she's like a neuroradiologist. I mean, so she's she's uh, a neurobiologist a, and she's a, a PhD. A brilliant, she's, yeah. brilliant person. Yeah. Yeah, she really uh, studied. She she studied. Um, uh, glucose uh, and, and the brain and um, aging, you know, for many years, uh, many decades, you know, she really started on the glucose, I think, during her PhD. So um, one surprising, um, you know, when people think about uh, uh, glucose, they think about sweet. Well, yes and no, but the spring onions, they are my favorite, actually, I grow them year round in a pot. Uh, they contain a uh, up to 88% of glucose. It, it's just incredible in terms of sugar. So, uh, of course, turnips, rutabaga, I don't care for rutabaga, but <laughs> uh, maybe because, you know, my dad was in uh, was a young boy during the war and uh, in, in France, and he ate a lot of rutabaga. There was nothing else to eat. So that's my little story. You know, apricots, apricots, uh, dried apricots, kiwi fruits, grapes. Um, onions and um, whole wheat bread, red beets are very good and, and honey for people who can also, uh, who are not vegan. Um, so we, we, we have to keep in mind that our brain is, is highly sensitive to any drop uh, of blood level. So please, please, please be mindful uh, a very good way to keep an eye on sugar intake is, is to watch the, um, food glycemic index, um, food that metabolize very quickly, uh, like candies, um, the cookies mm -hmm. uh, made of sucrose uh, generally contain very, very little fiber. And you know, on that list, you'll see that 
those fruits and vegetables are very high, have a very high content of fiber. There is a reason for that. It's very important for your, your, your digestive system and the health of, of your gut. So think about slow metabolism, uh, watch for this high metabolizing uh, product like the cookies and, and, um, and candies, and always choose when you have uh, choices, high fiber content um, that will help you control your insulin response too. The, don't forget that insulin resistance is also a, a major risk factor for dementia. This is, we talked about it earlier too. So another good reason to look for that good glucose. Uh, I could go on, but I'm running out of time. So the number seven is please, please connect with nature. Um, I don't know if you've, have you ever uh, experienced uh, or heard of forest bathing, Sandy? I'm sure you do that without knowing the term anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you go hiking right, in the woods, you know, that's what it is. Forest bathing, or what I was telling you earlier, something like sound bath, right? Sound bathing. Yeah. This is, these are new terms that uh, a lot of communities do. So trees and birds, water, it's no, nothing better than like, in a peaceful, attractive environment with lots of oxygen and animals. And, you know, you crack up and, you know, a smile and you feel good. This is really real, you know, dopamine uh, stimulation. Um, the sounds also are very healing. And so focus on your breath, uh, be mindful and uh, of our mindfulness point number two and the last one um, is connect with your tribe find people with whom you can connect you feel good with uh, I know it's in all the AARP uh, articles that have been written um, but it has been it has been proven you know look at the the blue zones, they all live in communities, they all have belief systems, they have um, shared knowledge. Um, you want to find people with whom you, you feel good, people you feel understood, people you understand, and you share values and keep you know room for, for, um, for connections, for growth, and for meaningful conversations as well. Um, so, you know, overall, taking care of our brain, getting toward the conclusion here, is a lifelong process. We talk about menopause transition. I think this is critical. You're going to explain that to us again. Uh, 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 but, uh, Sandy, but there is, let's learn this as early as possible. And we keep uh, at every transition, at every age, you know, through every important times of our life, keep experimenting, keep rebalancing. Um, and the good news is, is when you feel, when you feed and when you treat yourself mindfully, uh, you'll boost your brain properly and uh, everything will improve your, your gut health and you age better and, um, and you feel better. Yeah, that's, those are all those measures that you described Natalie are just excellent and you know they're doable and and it just like you say it requires commitment and awareness and you know once again um, just want to emphasize that during the menopause transition these lifestyle measures are really really important because when we lose our estrogen as we've discussed in our earlier talks the brain really struggles um, it it, the brain, it can't, you know, even though it, you know, it needs the glucose, but it can't fuel itself as well without estrogen. It doesn't make its neurotransmitters as well. And it's more prone to anti-inflammation um, uh, because estrogen has anti-inflammatory effects. And so these lead to a lot of the symptoms, you know, like brain fog and mood disturbance and sleep disturbance. But even more of a concern is that as the brain is struggling, it may be Kind of like wearing itself out and maybe jump starting us to you know problems down the line so again these lifestyle measures are just so critical and if we if we follow them right now we you know we'd like you know i'm a big believer in estrogen hormone therapy because 
if it's the lack of estrogen that may be part of the problem, it seemed like it would help, but we don't have the long-term studies. So we can't go out and advise women, oh, you got to take estrogen. But you know, if you're taking estrogen for hot flashes, then that in combination with all these lifestyle measures are are you know probably your 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 best avenue for trying to keep your brain healthy through this transition. So it's just great advice, Natalie. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I I do believe in in the synergetic effect of estrogen, and those we've had discussions, you know, synergetic effect of of both estrogen and um, and lifestyle uh, changes. Um, and um, but probably our genetics too. But you know, this is a uh, another another talk. <laughs> um so Maybe yes we'll bring some more research we hope. oh yeah we need some more research but yes um this is probably working synergetically so sandy um i want to thank you so much it's been it's been a real pleasure working with you on these um webinars it's been a lot of work <laughs> uh, more than what we anticipated or that I anticipated, I thought, uh, but also a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, I, I, I decided to keep that uh, slide for, for, for the end and just uh, I'm going to add our contact numbers because oh. I think I've really experienced with you, you know, connecting with my tribe or, you know, <laughs> challenging my brain. Um, this is a perfect uh, uh, example of uh, look at us. I mean, we're smiling. There's really uh, something pretty uh, exceptional that happened. And uh, I love working that way. Um, and I hope, um, let me just put our, so you have um, my business card and you have uh, Sandy Rice, Dr. Rice's uh, blog. So do you, is it yourestrogenquestions.com? Right. Yeah. We hope. Um, yes. And, you know, welcome any, any questions or comments through my blog would be great. Exactly. I mean, we're here to, we're here to help and educate. That's, that's exactly our together. And, and it is, uh, it is my hope too, that uh, a lot of people get to benefit from this, um, this work that we produced. Um, it's going to be available for free and um, we will welcome um, questions on your blog and wherever it be, be redirected and we'd be happy to have um to answer those questions so great thank sandy you. thank you so pleasure, much pleasure working with you natalie likewise thank you thank you bye-bye bye-bye uh -huh.